Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Current Connect series. In today's episode, we will cover the latest developments for the month of October, right? So let's get started. First, there is an important current affairs topic which is Scheduled Tribes and Other Traditional Forest Dwellers Act of 2006 which has recently made headlines, right? First thing first, let's understand why this topic is in news. So the recent reports reveal that nearly 40% of the land claims under the Forest Rights Act have been rejected by the various state governments, right? Now let's dig deeper into the Forest Rights Act of 2006. So before the enactment of this Forest Rights Act, Earlier laws failed to recognize the symbiotic relationship of the scheduled tribes or the ASTs with the forest and the and their dependence on them, right? Now the section 3, uh, clause 1, subsection A of the FRA is important in this context. It recognizes the rights of forest dwelling tribal communities or FDSTs and other traditional forest dwellers or OTFDs to hold and live in forest uh, land for uh, habitation habitation and for self-cultivation or li livelihood purposes, right? The Act also grants two types of rights. One is individual forest right and the second is community forest right. IFR or the individual forest right includes the right to hold and live in the forest land while the CFR or the community forest right aims to restore customary and traditional rights of forest dwelling community. The Act also gives community forest resource management rights, granting ownership, access and use of minor forest produce traditionally collected within or outside village boundaries, right? Now the implementation of this uh, Forest Right Act lies with the state governments and the Gram Sabha plays a crucial role in initiating the process for determining individual or community forest rights, right? Now the land titles are recognized under the FRA with certain limitations that is not to exceed beyond 4 hectares of land, right? And the Act also allows diversion of forest land for local development subject to a 3-tier approval process. The Gram Sabha initiates the process first, followed by the subdivisional level committee and then the district level committee. And the district level committee's decision on the forest rights is final and binding. So it's crucial to note that the Act is applicable in scheduled areas as per the Article 244 of the Constitution of India and Along with that, it is also applicable to protected areas including national parks, wildlife sanctuaries and tiger reserves as well. So that is all you need to know as far as exam is concerned. Moving on, the next topic is on the, uh, the recent development in the Indian Ocean Dream Association or IORA following the Council of Foreign Ministers meeting that is held in Colombo, Sri Lanka recently. The recent meeting in Colombo revolved around the theme Strengthening Regional Architecture, Reinforcing Indian, Indian Ocean Identity. Right, so now let's explore the key outcomes. The meeting resulted in the adoption of Colombo Communique or, and, the, and along with that IORA Vision 2030 and beyond. These documents will shape the future course of action for the IORA member countries. The chairship of IORA was officially transferred from Bangladesh to Sri Lanka for the term 2023 to 2025, right? And India is set to assume the chairship during the 2025 to 27 period. But before we delve deeper, let's understand what IORA is about. It was established in 1997 based on Nelson Mandela's vision, right? And it aims to uh, strengthen the regional cooperation and sustainable development within the Indian Ocean region. With 23 member countries within the Indian Ocean region and Council of Foreign Ministers serve serving as the apex body which meets uh, annually to address various issues related to the Indian Ocean region. Right? So there are 23 member countries and Council of Foreign Ministers is the apex board. So and IORA also focuses on six priority areas which includes maritime safety, security, fishery management and disaster risk, uh, risk management as well. And there is a special fund to support all these activities and programs that are proposed by the Indian Ocean Dream Association. And the Indian Ocean Dream Association comprises uh, one third of world's population, handles 80% of global oil trade, and produces ap approximately 1 trillion USD in goods and services. And also, the intra IORA trade of uh, around $800 billion is there. And for India, the Indian Ocean Dream Association provides a crucial avenue to manage big power rivalry, that is China, uh, as well as keeping in, uh, the Indian Ocean region stable, isn't it? And most importantly, since Pakistan is not a member of IORA, 
it serves as a less contentious space space for regional cooperation for india right now next on next moving on to the topic on recently released global hunger index for 2023 which has brought some concerning revelations especially for india now what is global hunger index so it's an annual report crafted by the irish ngo concern worldwide and german ngo wealth hunger health fit the ghi aims to track and measure hunger globally regionally as well as nationally by promoting action to combat hunger worldwide in the global hunger index 2023 edition india find itself ranked 111 out of 125 countries which paints a serious picture of uh, hunger that is uh, that exists in our nation the ghi score uh, which is a comprehensive measure based on multiple indicators stands at 28.7 on a scale of 100 for india now the ghi score is derived from our four critical indicators you need to remember this undernourishment child stunting child wasting and child mortality and interestingly india's progress in combating hunger hunger unfortunately plateaued since 2015 and the report also brings attention to the south asia and africa to the south of sahara by identifying them as the uh, uh, regions with highest level of hunger right so you need to remember who publishes the gsi what are the indicators and what is india's rank in the index as far as your exam is concerned now the next topic is on the legendary agricultural scientist ms swaminathan who recently passed away so as a plant uh, genetic uh, genesis geneticist Now he played a crucial role in shaping India's agricultural landscape, isn't it? So let's dive uh, dive into his extraordinary life and his contributions. He is recognized as the farmer scientist, and he received the first World Food Prize in 1987 for his leadership in India's green revolution. Additionally, he was honored with Padma Vibhushan, the Ramon Magsaysay Award, and several other national and international honors. Swaminathan's genetic research focused on developing high yielding and pest resistant crop varieties which revolutionized the Indian rice and wheat production. And notably the achievements include the development of rice varieties like ADT27, Rasi and the Pusa Basmati along with wheat varieties like Sonalika and Kalyan Sona. Swaminathan also developed a frost resistant potato uh, variety called Alaska Frostless which uh, 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 he also Further championed the participatory breeding, which uh, empowered the farmers to develop locally adapted crop varieties as well. Right, and he was described as the father of economic ecology by United Nations Environment Programme. And Swaminathan advocated for the evergreen revolution, and this approach aimed at improving productivity perpetually without ecological harm by blending organic farming, green agriculture, and eco agriculture. Swaminathan also played a key role in the development of protection of plant varieties and farmers rights act of 2001 his contribution also extend to disaster management with, uh, where he advocated proactive measures and introduced contest concepts like drought code flood code etc so swaminathan's uh, legacy is embedded in india's agricultural history is it his vision his commitment and tireless efforts have left an incredible incredible mark by shaping policies our institutions and lives of our indian farmers right moving on next topic is recently released periodic labor force survey plfs report for 2022-23 by national sample survey organization or the nsso this survey holds crucial insights into india's employment and unemployment scenario so let's explore the key findings and indicators Firstly, PLFS initiated in 2017 with an aim to estimate essential employment and unemployment indicators annually. And this include labor force participation rate LFPR, worker population ratio or WPR and unemployment rate or UR both in urban area under current weekly status or CWX and in both rural and urban areas annually under usual status. Now the PL, PLFS, as I said, rely on three core indicators: the LFPR, firstly the LFPR, which is the percentage of person in the labour force in the population, and it represents those who are working or seeking work. Right. Next is worker population ratio or the WPR, which indicates the percentage of employed persons in the population. So it provides insights into the workforce size. and then the un- unemployment rate uh, rate or the ur which represents persons unemployed unemployed among those in the labor force 
and it sheds light in uh, on the unemployment scenario in the country so if you see the data both lfpr and wpr show a remarkable increase as the unemployment rate has significantly reduced during this survey period next activity status is determined based on the activities pursued during the specific reference period the plfs therefore employs two reference periods one is usual status with a reference period of 365 days which provides a comprehensive view of long term activity isn't it and second is current weekly status or cws with a reference period of 7 days and this captures short term fluctuation in employment and unemployment and these insights from plfs guide are policy formulation as well policy makers can utilize this data to tailor interventions and initiatives that address specific challenges in the labor market right so that is all about the plfs report 2022-23 next on uh it is uh, next topic is on uh india's position in the global innovation index to 2023 released by the world intellectual property organization on wipo the global innovation index or gii is a vital tool for governments worldwide for evaluating innovation led social and economic changes right and it is co-published annually by cornell university in sir business school and wipo it measures innovation based on various criteria including institutions human capital research and infrastructure now in 2023 edition india holds the 40th rank globally now let's delve into the india specific insights in the index india leads the lower middle income group and maintains a stable innovation position right and india is recognized as uh, an innovation award performer for the 30th uh, 13th consecutive year by showcasing consistent growth for the last 13 year india has been consistently growing in terms of innovation notably india has surpassed the uk and germany in publication output ranking fourth in 2022 and for and four of our indian technology clusters that are bangalore uh, delhi chennai and mumbai are among the top 100 clusters globally so india's ranking in the gii has broader implication for the country's economic and social development isn't it and the insights provide, uh, provided can also guide strategic decisions to foster more innovation driven environment in the country right and the gii uses a comprehensive set of criteria as i mentioned to measure the innovation so which encompasses institutions human capital research infrastructure credit investment linkages knowledge creation absorption diffusion and creative outputs and for your information switzerland retains its position as the leader in the gii for the 30th 13th consecutive year and the report also highlights strong technological progress and adoption of innovation like electric vehicles and automation on a global scale right so that is all about the global innovation index of 2023 next topic is on a concerning environmental issue that is the severe drought in the amazon river which so the lake uda kekera uh which is in the amazon river, uh, river basin is facing an unprecedented crisis as it dries up this left the floating villages on it uh, uh on it now stranded on mud flats right so the floating villages that were once on the lake are now residing on a mud flat because of the drying of the clay and now this alarming situation is indicative of a larger issue that is affecting the entire amazon region right so the severe drought in the amazon amazon uh, region is actually attributed to multiple factors including el nino and the warming of the northern tropical atlantic ocean right and additionally these climatic phenomena are further enhanced by global warming and continued burning of fossil fuels as you may know the amazon river basin is the largest drainage basin globally which covers about 34% of the south africa south american landmass and this Uh, vast expanse also contains approximately 60% of the world's rainforest for which it is often referred to as the lungs of the earth right and it also supports 10% of the planet's known form of life it uh, uh, the amazon uh, basin actually spans across multiple countries including brazil bolivia colombia ecuador uh, guyana peru suriname and venezuela remarkably both the equator and the tropic of capricorn passes through brazil which makes it a key player in the amazon river basin the drying up of these water bodies within amazon uh, has severe repercussion for the delicate ecosystem within the near forest isn't it and also the human impact is equally profound these floating villages now transform into mud flats are struggling with their loss 
uh, loss of their homes and also the livelihoods. And therefore, the need for sustainable solution become increasingly urgent to address the challenges faced by these communities, isn't it? Next topic is on the phosphorus scarcity in India, which poses a challenge not only for our agriculture, but also for global geopolitics and environmental health. Now, India is the world's largest importer of phosphorus and it heavily relies on cadmium laden deposits of West Africa. The limited domestic uh, phosphate reserves lie in the regions like uh, Lalitpur of UP, Masuri Syncline and Kadab Basin of Andhra Pradesh. However, the bulk of the phosphate rocks that, you, that we use are coming from two states that are Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh. And globally also, phosphate reserves are con concentrated in a handful of countries including Morocco, Western Sahara, China and Algeria. And the control over these reserves raises a significant geopolitical concern impacting global trade and resource dynamics, isn't it? And from environmental point of view, the coexistence of phosphorus with cadmium is a major concern. Cadmium, which is a heavy metal as you know, poses a significant environmental and health risk. Its removal is an expensive process as well and its presence in fertilizer can lead to bioaccumulation in crops and it will ultimately lead, uh, lead to bioaccumulation in human bodies as well, isn't it? And additionally, phosphorus runoff from agricultural activities and sewage into water bodies contribute to the growth of toxic algal bloom. Therefore, the challenges surrounding the phosphorus availability calls for urgent attention to sustainable agricultural practices, which includes efficient use of fertilizer and exploration of alternative nutrient sources, isn't it? So that is all about the phosphorus depletion that uh, India currently faces. Next topic is on the recently announced Nobel Prizes for the uh, year 2023. Right? The Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine for 2023 went to Catalin Carrico, Drew Wisman for their groundbreaking work in mRNA vaccines, which is a technology that has played a pivotal role in transforming the landscape of medicine and public health, health worldwide. And in the field of physics, uh, in the field of physics, Pierre Agostini. Parents Krauss and Anna Quiller uh, awarded for their remarkable contribution to the understanding of electron dynamics in matter. And Nobel Prize for uh, Chemistry is awarded to Mongi Bawendi, uh, Louis Burus, and Alexei Ekimo for their groundbreaking work and discoveries and synthesis of quantum dots. Their work opens new frontiers in material science with uh, potential application across various industries. And this year's Nobel Prize in New Literature was given to John Posse for his innovative plays and prose, which have been described as giving voice to unsaved, right? And the Nobel Prize uh, uh, for Peace or the Nobel Peace Prize goes to Nargis Mohammadi by recognizing her tireless efforts in the fight against women's oppression in Iran. And in the field of economic sciences, Claudia Golden is honored for her extensive research on the gender gap in the labor market. Uh, her work shared light on crucial aspects of economic inequality and it also paves the way for informed policy decision right next up world health organization has given its approval for the r21 matrix same uh, malaria vaccine for the prevention of malaria in children and this marks a crucial step towards the ongoing battle against this deadly disease isn't it now, the R21 Matrix same vaccine has been granted a license for use in Ghana, Nigeria and Burkina Faso and it is developed coll collaboratively by the Jenner Institute at Oxford University and the Serum Institute of India. This vaccine stands out for its cost-effectiveness, high efficacy and safety that are demonstrated through various clinical trials. And for your information, malaria is caused by the uh, uh, plasmodium parasites which are transmitted to humans through bites of infected female anopheles uh, mosquitoes, isn't it? Also, it remains a major global health concern, particularly affecting regions with limited access to preventive healthcare. Next up, uh, Indian Air Force prepares to induct the indigenous Astra beyond visual range air-to-air -air missile by the end of 2023. So let's explore the key features and advancements of this Astra missile family. The Astra missile family is developed by the DRDO, which marks a significant milestone in India's indigenous defense capability. It uh, stands as the country's first indigenous air-to-air -air missile, specifically designed for beyond visual range engagements. The Astra missile has already been successfully integrated into Su-30 Mark 1, 
and has undergone successful test firings from LCA Tejas. Now this Astra missile utilizes radar guidance for precise navigation and targeting and this capability ensures that the missile can engage and neutralize targets even beyond the range of direct visual contact, right? And in turn, it enhances the effectiveness of uh, Indian Air Force in various operational scenarios, isn't it? Now, the last topic is a scheme that has been in use recently, that is the Prime Minister's Street Vendors Atmanirvar Nidhi or PM Swanidhi scheme. With over 46.54 lakh small working capital loans dispersed in just uh, three years, this scheme is a representation of financial empowerment for street vendors across the nation. PM Swanidhi scheme is a central sector scheme and it is fully funded by the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs and its primary objective are to facilitate working capital loans by incentivizing regular repayment and it also rewards digital transactions among the street vendors. Right. Now, microfinance institutions, NBFCs or the non-banking financial, uh, financial companies and self-help groups are key lending agencies here. Because of their ground level presence, they are uh, more uh, they are more equipped to reach to the common mass, right? And the scheme is available to the street vendors in across states or UDs that have notified rules and schemes under the Street Vendors Act of 2014. Now, PM Swanidhi also introduces a third term loan of up to uh, 50,000 rupees in addition to the existing 10,000 rupees and 20,000 rupees loan, collateral free loans, interest subsidies, credit limit expansion, and no penalty on early repayment are some of the benefits that are provided to our street vendors. And as you can see, PM Swanidhi contributes to financial inclusion by integrating street vendors into the formal financial system, isn't it? Additionally, a capacity building and financial literacy program along with information, education and communication activities or IEC will be launched nationwide in collaboration with state governments to educate these street vendors on various aspects of financial literacy. Right? So that brings us to the end of this episode of Current Connect. We hope this episode has provided you with valuable insights and knowledge about these crucial matters. Stay tuned for more updates in our next episode where we will keep you informed about the latest developments in various fields. Right? Thank you for joining us and until next time, stay curious and keep exploring the world around you.